Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chad, for that kind introduction. Uh, so first of all, before I begin, I just want to give a big thanks to the Thayer School and uh, for inviting me for the Jones Seminar Series. I'm really excited to be here. It was great getting to meet some of you today. And I'm excited to talk with you about some of the work that I've done here at NC State, some of the uh, teaching things that I've done. And I hope that, you know, if nothing else, you guys can take a few things away from this talk that you might be able to use uh, with your teaching as well, just to kind of help you along with, um, you know, perhaps improving your courses. So I'm going to talk about a few things. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about active learning. So, you know, that's basically getting more student involvement in your courses. I'm also going to talk about conceptual understanding, the need for conceptual understanding. We'll talk a lot about that, as well as testing, how to determine how much students actually know about the concepts you're trying to teach them, which is important for engineers. I'm going to talk about some work that I did with plagiarism screening software. This builds into ethics. I think it would be naive to think that there aren't fraternity houses with huge filing cabinets full of laboratory reports, right? So that's one of the things that I want to be sure that my students know that I'm keeping up on them with. And then also, I want to talk a little bit about the need for engineering teamwork, and then as well, how to make engineering teamwork a little bit easier to handle for instructors, because that takes a lot of time commitment in order to make that work smoothly. So one of the things I want to make clear, teaching assistant professor, right? I'm on the instruction track. I don't have a research program, a technical research program. I do pedagogical research. So I think about teaching a lot. So let's think about this question. Let's say that we get to the end of a semester, you've got a professor, they do their very best to teach a great course. But then once it's all over, they get their end of semester course evaluations from the students, and they're very disappointed to find that it didn't work out very well for them, right? The students didn't like the course, lots and lots of negative feedback. So, what could have happened here? Does anyone have any kind of answer for that? What might have happened? Anybody? Anybody? Yes? It was more difficult than people thought it was going to be. More difficult than people thought it was going to be. That's, that's a great, great answer. I've heard that from my own students, right? OK, so let's, let's actually turn this a little differently, right? Um, why don't you turn to the person next to you? We're all a big, happy family here at Dartmouth, right? Turn to the person next to you come up with answers to this question, and I'm looking for quantity. I don't even want quality necessarily. I want as many answers as possible that you can get with, with the person that's next to you. Please, humor me, turn to the person next to you and discuss. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, you probably have had a little bit of time to come up with some good responses. So let's go around. Let's see what people came up with. So John, I met you earlier today. I'm going to pick on you a little bit. What, what was one of the things that you guys came up with? Well, um, we're speaking a little bit about just the clarity of uh, the students' expectations going in. And, um, if, if it was clear that um, it would be a very technical course and mm -hmm. uh, some of the demands. Yeah saying is, you know, maybe clarity. Maybe you didn't make it very clear in the syllabus or, or some other course material exactly what you expected of the students. Um, what about you? What do you think? I just want to thank you for letting us talk about how we do a poor job teaching. <laughs> <laughs> All the things we do. Oh, so. that's, that's certainly not my intention, right? <laughs> because, you know, I'll tell you this, too. I certainly don't get everything right. My yeah. students will tell you I certainly don't get everything right. So the, the last thing we came up with was just uh, not handing back graded assignments. On. Not handing back graded assignments, or at least in a timely fashion, Probably, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I've heard that same thing from students. Brian, what about you? What'd you come up with? I, I was checking my emails. <laughs> checking, checking emails. So you know, it's to that in just a minute. I'll get to that in just a minute too. Okay, let's get let's get one more. Uh, miss, if you don't mind, what did you guys come up with? Uh, 
we mentioned expectations too, whether they thought it was going to be more hands-on or less hands-on, or the professor said, I'll post my PowerPoints and they don't do it, or mm -hmm. something like that that the students need. Okay, that's great, that's great. And I totally agree with all the things that you just said, even the fellow who said that he was checking his emails, right? So the big thing here is that we've all been in classes before, right, where the professor does basically what I did in the beginning, where he says, you know, ask a question to the whole class, everybody kind of slinks down in their chairs a little bit, right? An intrepid fellow at the front of the room raises his hand, and then everyone else, you know, whoo, goes back to their cell phones or their crossword puzzles, right? And, you know, stops paying attention. But the second time that we did it, you know, that, that's called active learning. And what was different about those things? Well, there were more responses, right? I didn't see more than one hand, and it took a minute for that hand to go up. And at the very least, we had that din of conversation, right? You were all talking with each other about the topic, hopefully, that I told you, you know, I wanted you to discuss. And we also, this took working in teams, right? You turn to the person next to you, maybe you don't even know them. But the point is, is that there's someone else who's interested in education, skilled in the art, somebody that you can bounce ideas off of before you have to come out and say it in front of all these people in this room, right? So this is active involvement in class. And this is one of the things that I really try to do with my students. You know, let's just get talking about it. Why not? You know, we're all here. All those students are paying for these courses. Why don't we actually put them to work, make them think about what they're doing? And what they find is that if you go and dig into the literature, the cognitive psychologists, right, they say that, you know, we as humans have a really short attention span, apparently getting shorter, right, with cell phones and everything else. But at the same time, they say, even if you're interested in a topic, your interest starts to wane after about 20 minutes. So a lot of times what I try to do in my lectures, maybe every 20 minutes, throw in an active learning activity, right? Something just to get people going. Even if what they do is, you know, just turn to their neighbor and just kind of haphazardly talk about what's going on, they can at the very least get back into the flow of, okay, now I'm ready to listen to the professor instead of just hearing them prattle on for 60 minutes, that sage on the stage kind of idea. Resetting with active learning can help re attention, and then likewise it's going to help retention as well. So let's look at this from a student perspective. You know, I remember whenever I was an undergrad, I got really nervous whenever I wanted to answer a question. Engineering's hard. I think it's really difficult. Our students think it's difficult. And the thing is, is that I didn't want to sound like a fool in front of all the people that were in the room with me, all my colleagues and everything, right? So likewise, if I ever had a professor who maybe noticed that I didn't answer any questions, and then he says a question, says, Cooper, what do you think? I would probably freak out, be really upset, and mumble like, oh, I, I don't know. And then I would hate that professor forever, <laughs> right? I don't want that to happen. Why not let students, especially if they're nervous, why not let them bounce an idea that they have off of a colleague? It would have made all the difference if I just could have said to the person next to me, do you also think that the pump capacity is going to be higher or this pressure is going to be lower? Do you also think that? Okay, great. Now I don't feel so bad because someone else feels the same way that I do, right? So students also sometimes say, you know, when are we ever going to use this? I want more real life challenges. Working with somebody else that maybe you don't know, that's a real life challenge. That's what they're going to be posed with whenever they go out to work in industry too. It's not like you go out into industry and they say, okay, well, this is your first day. Tell us who you want to work with. Tell us the way you want to work, and we'll totally cater to you. It's not the way it works. Whoever you essentially is who you're going to work with, and you're going to have to be able to work together towards a common goal. And that's one of the things I really want to instill in our students. And sometimes students will be reluctant at first, like Brian with his uh, checking his email on his cell phone. Sorry to pick on you, Brian. But, you know, the thing is, too, is that there will be some students who are just too cool for school, right? They're going to say, this active learning stuff is garbage, and I'm personally not interested in it. And there are a few things you can do. For instance, I make my active learning exercises on the tough stuff, the things that are really difficult to understand. So basically, if they don't participate, well, wait until that tough stuff shows up on an exam, and you didn't participate in any of the activities that we did. Students catch on really fast. But another thing, even if we go through, and there's a few holdouts, and there will be. I find it's about one or two in 50, right? There will be some people who are just going to completely check out. 
they're not going to listen to you at all. And the rest of the students, they're doing their thing, talking to each other, trying to come up with answers like I want them to. I don't lose five seconds of sleep over those students that aren't paying attention. Because you know what? I got the other 90-some-odd percent of them all talking about what I wanted them to talk about and being involved in the course. So those students who don't want to participate, that's on them, right? Again, they're paying me up here to teach them. If they don't want to participate, that's their problem. So what makes a good active learning exercise? I avoid the trivial questions. Let's see what happened here. Where's my AV guy? <laughs> your laptop go to sleep? Oh, maybe. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Let's try this again. <laughs> Not an active learning exercise. Okay, there we go. Sorry for the technical snafu, guys. Okay, avoid trivial questions. This is actually one of the key things that people, whenever they first try active learning, this is one of the things that they don't quite get right. They make the questions way too easy, to the point that you don't need to talk to anybody else about it, right? Instead, they just say... They turn to their neighbor and say, they say something like, oh, the answer's higher, right? Yeah. And then that's it. And then you're giving them another minute to talk about it, but they've already found out the answer, and most of the class has too. Well, now you've wasted that 45 seconds or whatever that you're giving them to talk about it. That's not really what you want to do. You want to make these questions difficult. And again, focus on the hard topics. Focus on the things you're going to test them on, right? So that then they can talk over it with one of their colleagues and they can figure out what they want. Also, you want to make these short. You want to make them about 15 seconds to three minutes, three minutes maximum. If you make them too long, again, you're going to have some people who are going to be done, the really good ones, will be done in like two minutes. And if you're giving them eight minutes to complete the exercise, again, you've lost those six minutes out of your lecture. You don't want to do that. Also, teams of two to four, you know, if we have a group of like three people all sitting together, it's fine. It doesn't need to be two people. It can be three. It can be four, whatever. It's whatever is manageable, right? Two to four tends to work really best. And also, I call on people at random. I let my students know that. You don't want to use volunteers or else, if they catch on that you're going to always go for volunteers after the active learning exercises, the rest of them just won't participate because they know somebody, the intrepid people in the front, right? They're going to be right on top of it. So instead, you go around and you ask questions to everybody, right? And I try to ask every single person something over the course of the semester so that they know that eventually it's going to be their turn. Also, you want to discuss the answers after you get them. Say, well, was that a good answer? Was that a bad answer? And then why? But you never want to insult a student's answer. Say something like, well, that's a dumb answer. Or you really should have thought about that more, right? Because you're going to lose them. You're going to lose them. And a big part of being a good teacher, I think, is having that student-teacher relationship be really strong, right? You want the students, they don't necessarily need to like you, but they need to trust you. And if you say something like, that's a stupid answer, that trust is gone, right? And you want to avoid that. So what can you ask about? Well, the content is only limited by your imagination. So I ask lots of questions, right? Unsteady state processes are great because they're really tough to understand, I think. So I ask lots of questions. I'm from West Virginia, as uh, Chad had mentioned. So, you know, a batch distillation column, like a moonshine still, right? What happens to process variables like concentration of ethanol in the moonshine still as time passes? Well, it's going to go down because you're boiling out the ethanol. Well, what about the ethanol concentration in the distillate? You know, what's coming out? Students will often just say, well, it has to be going up, right? No, it goes down too because, again, you're getting rid of the ethanol. What's left in the still is lean in ethanol as time passes. So that's a tough question. And again, getting students to talk with each other, and maybe they disagree initially. And then they have to convince each other which one's right. That's learning that they're doing on their own. They're doing my job for me, right? Because they're starting to teach each other. That debate that they're having is really important. Also, real-world applications. This is something that's key because it's very easy to get lost in just theory, book learning, all that kind of thing whenever you're in a lecture. How can you apply that knowledge? How can you apply that forced convection is better than natural convection? 
If you've ever been to a picnic and you've got a hot bite of macaroni and cheese, you don't just let it sit there, right? You want that bite of macaroni and cheese, so you blow on it. So it cools off faster. That's forced convection. That's the difference here, right? So these kind of things are really good active learning questions to ask. And you can ask anything you want, anything that you come up with. And a lot of times, I don't script my active learning. Whenever I'm talking and I'm like, oh, here's something I kind of want to ask, let's just ask the students. And then a lot of times you get really good responses. And you just keep asking until you get the response that you want. And if you don't get the response that you want, maybe you didn't teach them very well. Maybe there's something that you missed out on. And you know what? That's self-critique for me. I really want to know. I didn't teach the difference between forced and natural convection well enough. I think I need to do a better job this time. We can talk about it. And then next time, whenever I teach the class again, I know I need to focus on that a little bit more. So we talked about active learning. And now we're going to talk about conceptual knowledge. Because, you know, a lot of what I try to do in active learning is like, well, what's happening? The real world application, what would happen as time passes? And whenever you think about learning, I always go back to Bloom's taxonomy. If you're familiar with this, it's a study that came out some years ago. And what they said is that you've really got, again, what they found is that you've really got, excuse me, guys, I'm sorry, this is a, a problem again. Okay. So what they found is that there are really tiers to learning. So you've got remembering at the bottom. And this is something that a parrot can do, right? A parrot can literally, literally remember something that was told to it and then parrot it back to you. That's not really learning, per se, right? That's just remembering something. And then we go up, and at the very top, ah, I see what happened now. There's a button on this thing. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, active learning. active learning. No, so you can see that as you go uh, category, you start to see things like analyzing, and then at the very top is designing things. And for anyone who's a professor, you guys know this, the first time you ever teach a course, don't you learn so much about the subject the very first time you ever teach it? Because now you're not just solving problems, you're writing them, right? You're creating new material that you have to really understand the material if you're going to do that. And the creating that you're doing is really helping you learn, right? So what I like to think about is that whenever we look at traditional coursework, I know a lot of the coursework that I've done, I've been kind of presented equations. And I haven't gotten a lot of focus on the elegant concepts that are underlying, say, the Cedar-Tate correlation to predict what the heat transfer coefficient for force convection is. I didn't really know why. And someone would say, well, as velocity goes up, force convection heat transfer goes up. Why does that happen? Well, velocity's in the numerator, right? It doesn't have any kind of context for what's really happening. As velocity goes up, the thickness of the boundary layer around the object goes down. So heat resistance goes down, heat transfer coefficient goes up. That's really what's happening, right? But with you going through school as a bachelor's uh, degree, um, student, I didn't pick up on all that. You know, I really didn't. And I think it's because I got so dug into the computational part of it. And I was good at math, but I wasn't learning engineering the way that I needed to. So if you don't learn the concepts that are underneath, you can't make those intuitive leaps that we call real science, research. You can't do that because you don't know what's really going on underneath all of the equations, right? So there's a difference between being able to perform the calculations and then actually knowing what it all means, what the significance of those calculations are, right? And you've probably noticed this in some of your classes. They'll find something crazy, like the RPM of a tire on a car is 180,000 RPM. Is that even reasonable? It's not. But they don't know. It's off by a factor of 1,000, and they can't quite put it together. Now, as someone skilled in the art who understands the concepts, you would immediately say, no, that's not right. But they haven't quite gotten the concept. And that's the student that I was whenever I was graduating. So what I like to do, I use concept inventories a lot. And you, especially if you're a physicist, the physics people have been all over this. They cracked this nut 20 years ago. And we're a little slow to pick up on this in engineering. So 
Concept inventories are where you ask questions that require absolutely no calculations, right? It's strictly on the concept. So, for instance, a common thing that I had when I worked in the private sector, I worked for RTI International. That's a research institute. So I was doing a fixed bed catalytic reactor process, right? And it was the synthesis of methanol. And so you're taking gases in, you know, and you've got one mole of gas coming out, three moles in, one mole out. And I asked a student, uh, not a student, a young engineer who we had hired, a bachelor's degree student, I asked them, well, let's say we increase pressure. Is the productivity going to go up, down, or stay the same? And you know what they wanted to do? They wanted to go back to their desk so they could do calculations for the rest of the afternoon and tell me. And that's not what they should have done. They should have said, well, let's think about Le Chatelier's principle, and that's an equilibrium reaction, and that's going to push it to the right-hand side. So we would expect to see that productivity would go up, right? But that's one of those things that's really tough to kind of figure out. And once you learn a concept, it's not that you're even remembering it anymore. It's not like you're remembering it as a fact. It's part of how you perceive everything around you, right? It's part of the way you view the world. And there are lots of different ways to do concept inventories. Clicker questions are really popular, right? You can do that. Also, traditional quizzes, like you ask them a question like this, and then they literally answer it. You assign a grade based on it. So that's one way that you can do it. And I wanted to give you guys this. This is a list of concept inventories for lots of different disciplines and general engineering. So you know, go to these kind of websites and see if there's any concepts that are conceptual instruments, I should say, inventories and that kind of thing that you can use to judge how well your students understand the concepts. If you dig into the literature, they find that STEM students really have a bad understanding of concepts whenever you start testing them this way. And it's really good to be able to evaluate, well, are we really teaching them the right thing? Do they actually know what, we're do or what they're doing? Because again, there's a difference between being able to finish off all those calculations and actually knowing what it all means, right? So if you guys want these slides, I'll certainly leave them so that you can, they can be distributed. I don't want you to feel like you have to feverishly write down all of these things. So I think about communication, too, because I tell my students that, you know, though they might dislike writing, you know, they think once they get out of English 101, that's the last time that they're going to have to ever write anything. Couldn't be further from the truth, right? Even if they got a job where they sat in a cube and relations all day, they're going to have to communicate those results to somebody. And you know what? It's probably going to be as a quarterly report or an annual report or something like that. And more to the point, their career upside is going to be dictated by how well they can communicate. There are lots and lots of smart people, right? Lots of engineers who can do calculations all day long. But you find some engineers who can really write, really speak, now you've got somebody that's incredibly valuable to the workforce, right? I want to be able to develop those kinds of skills in my engineering students. My goal is, I, you know, the product that we're putting out as professors Right? That's what we're putting out. I want those students to go out into industry, and I want people to say, wow, those chemi students from NC State, those guys are good. We want more of those. Good for industry, good for my students that I care about in my department. Right? I really want those students to be great. So one of the things that I do is I kind of combine this conceptual testing with writing. So it's as simple as really asking the students to explain themselves. Notice here, simple question, right? We got a little syringe. It's spraying water into the air. There are three labeled points on it. Well, which point is the kinetic energy of the fluid the highest? Well, you know, you might be able to guess. I mean, you got, what, a one in three chance of getting it right for part A, right? But the thing is, look at part B. Explain. That's all I got to do. Why? What's the answer? Just tell me why. So there are really two things that students have to do here they need to not only have the conceptual knowledge to be able to answer that question, but they also need to be able to communicate it in a very brief statement to somebody else. And combining those two challenges can really help not only develop those kind of skills in the students, but you can really figure out what they learn. And one of my favorite things is whenever I see a paper, because I grade all of these, whenever I see a quiz where a student says one thing for part A, starts to write the answer to part B, and then they go back and scratch out their answer to part A. And then they put a new one and then explain themselves. 
So you might remember when we look back at Bloom's taxonomy, critiquing was near the top of that pyramid. That self-critique, that's learning, right? That you're observing learning whenever that happens. People questioning their own conceptions and misconceptions. We do that all the time, right? As scientists, we have to. Am I wrong about this? Have I missed something? I want the students to do that too. That's part of the process I want them to start thinking about. So another thing I do, I always want to listen to the students because they will be very frank with their feedback, right? I'm sure you guys know. So I like to ask the students what they think about a lot of the methods that I'm using in my classes. And here we have one, and my, the top one's one of my favorites. I couldn't have said it better myself. So this person said that when classes are focused on number crunching, they feel like they leave knowing how to solve problems, but they don't know what they did, right? They don't even know what they did. They enjoy knowing what was going on behind the math. They enjoy it. I mean, that's, that's great. I mean, the students want to learn, right? And they probably just get bored whenever we give them so many equations to solve, you know? They want to understand what's going on. And again, this is lifelong learning. They get to take these knowledges, the concepts, and keep it with them their whole lives. So all of these students had good things to say. The negative comments that I tend to get on concept quizzes, students think that they're too hard, which is kind of the point. But they also think that maybe I assign too much credit for them. It's worth, there are 11 of these concept quizzes I give in my courses over the course of the semester, and they're worth 2% of the grade apiece. So they say, wow, they're really hard. But I'll tell you what, at the end, whenever I give them exams and I test them on those concepts, they know those concepts. They don't mess it up on the exams because, again, we've talked about all of these things in class, and I've tested them on them. And they know I'm going to test them on the concepts. So what do they do? They study the concepts. They try to learn them. And that's really good for their overall learning. So now we're into plagiarism. We talked a little bit about writing. And again, you can't be naive. I mean, we offer these labs, and there are students who take these labs. Their kid brother or sister comes up through a few years later. Here's all my old lab reports. Why don't you check these out and see what you think? They might help you as you go along. Well, the thing is, is that if they want to cheat, cutting and pasting all that text from their brother's report or maybe some website that does a really nice job explaining, I don't know, how a pump works. It's really easy to do. It used to be a lot harder to plagiarize before we had the internet and word processors, right? You would have had to have actually looked up something in a book and then literally written it down. It's not that way anymore. You want to plagiarize, it takes a few seconds. That's all it takes. So also, you know, the new generation that's coming up, they've been kind of internet culture where it's really easy to legally download media. So they have relaxed social views. If you dig into the literature, they have relaxed social views basically stealing things from the internet and passing it off as like, well, I can listen to this music anytime. Yeah, I totally downloaded it from some BitTorrent, but that's okay, right? I did it. It's fine. So they have these relaxed views on downloading this kind of content. And these students who are plagiarizing, there's a bunch of problems with this. And some of them are obvious. When you plagiarize, you're not learning. You're not developing the writing skills I want you to develop at all, right? Also, the honest students who are actually working really hard, trying to develop those skills I'm trying to instill in them, they get the B minus. Some other person cheats and get an A. I hate that. I hate that for those students who are working really hard. And I don't want that person who's cheating to get an A. And if this goes along unchecked, you know what? Those students who are getting B minuses are going to say, all these people who cheat get A's. You know what? I think we want to cheat. That just creates this culture of academic dishonesty. And again, you can't be naive. You've got to make sure that you keep an eye out for this. All of these consequences are small, though, compared to the more insidious thing. And this happened a few years ago. This was Mike McAdoo at UNC. He was a defensive end on their NCAA football team. So what happened with this was Mike McAdoo had written a paper, and it turned out that it had been footnoted and sourced by a tutor. Okay, literally just the tutor went in and put all of the citations in for them. <coughs> so whenever you know, the NCAA got wind of this, they said, okay, you're suspended a game. You know, one whole game out of the NCAA season. Mike McAdoo was furious. So he appealed. 
And as part of the appeal, they made the paper, the offending paper, public. And a third party, some people say it was NC State students, we have a big rivalry with them, they ran the paper through a plagiarism checker. And sure enough, it turned out he didn't just have a tutor source the paper, he had taken words directly verbatim from those sources and passed them off as his own. No quotes, no anything. So he had plagiarized. So now, let's look what happens. Now Mike McAdoo, he's suspended, period. Rest of the season. Okay, he doesn't ever play a game for UNC again. The professor whose class he was in, that guy's in trouble too. And you know where I got all this information from? The local newspaper, because the media loves to pick up on stuff like that. And the academic reputation of UNC was just drugged through the mud. Right? So I look at this, and I think to myself, what if I don't keep an eye out on plagiarism? And five, ten years down the road, I have a student who says, yeah, I cheated my whole way through Dr. Cooper's unit operations classes. Everybody did. That's going to make my department look bad. It's going to make me look bad. I might be looking for a new job, right? I don't want that to happen. I don't want that for my department, school, or me. So I have to be vigilant, even if I don't want to be, right? So what I want to do is talk about two approaches here. There's, you know, a lot of times when we look for plagiarism as instructors, we say, well, I would know it when I see it, right? I can just pick plagiarism out. Well, yeah, I mean, it's easy to do that way. You just read the paper. And if something pops out, like, I think that that quality of text reasonably exceeds what I would expect out of that student, right? Then we say maybe it's plagiarism. So what do you do? Maybe you take some of those sentences and you put it into Google, see if you can find it, right? You spot check for these sentences. That takes forever, right? It takes a really long time to do that. Trust me, I have. So if maybe they plagiarize their brother's paper, you, that's not going to have quality reasonably exceeding a student because a student originally wrote it. And you're lying to yourself if you think you're going to remember a lab report that you read from a student three or four years ago, right? So all of this stuff combined makes it that you've got to be vigilant. And the way I'm vigilant is I use a computer program to do it. So this is plagiarism screening software. And I want to show you guys just briefly how this works because if you're not familiar with it, it's a pretty interesting little thing. So here are two reports. There's the pump experiment and the heat exchanger report. Names omitted to save the guilty, right? So these two reports. One's 28% similarity score. And what this program does is it just says, OK, let's look at all the matches that are more than four or five words, compare them against a database that includes internet articles, periodicals, journal articles, right? Um, books, all sorts of things. So let's take a look at these two papers very briefly. Notice that this heat exchanger report says 28% similarity. You would guess that the, you know, this heat exchanger report would have plagiarism, and then the other one wouldn't, right? Well, let's take a quick look at this paper. So again, this is just the little document viewer that pops up. And they have this originality. So what we can do is we can go through the paper. And what's coming up? Well, let's actually look at this first one. Introduction dot, 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 one, right? So that comes up as a match. I bet you that has been in a lot of papers, right? <laughs> we keep going, and we find other things. So this is about a heat exchanger. And here we have one. Objective of this experiment. That is four words, indeed, in a row that probably match other sources. That's not plagiarism. Single pass, double pipe heat exchanger, that, that's the way you call that piece of equipment, right? It's not that that's plagiarism at all. Indeed, those are many words in a row that are the same, but it's not plagiarism. So you've got to go through and look. But this 28%, why is it so high? I'm going to bury the lead here and go right to the main effector. So here at the end, we're coming down to process simulation output. One of the things that I have the students do is I have them simulate this process in Aspen, which is the process simulation software package. What comes up? Well, the header for Aspen comes up. And you know what? That matches what was in my dissertation, too, because I did Aspen simulations in my dissertation as well. And what all comes up? Well, the whole header, well, not the time, right? Because that's probably the only thing that didn't show up that matches something else that's online. There's no plagiarism in this paper. 
right? Now, if I would have just went off of that match percentage, which is what usually happens in junior highs and high schools that use this technology, the teacher's going to have some benchmark. If it's more than 25%, they're going to student conduct, right? Not what you want to do. You've got to go through these, right? You've got to show that you're going to actually care about the students and not just blindly, conv uh, blindly accuse them of plagiarism. Let's look at this pump experiment on the other hand. Again, lower match percentage. And let's zoom in. Okay, so centrifugal pump, blah, blah, blah. Let's look. Okay, plagiarism, right? A centrifugal pump is one of the simplest pieces of equipment. That's a whole sentence taken from some other source that isn't cited, right? That alone would be a problem. Look at that one sentence in the middle. The veins of the rotating impeller impart a radial and rotary motion to the fluid, forcing it to the outer periphery of the pump where it's collecting the volume. That is a very careful and elegant way to describe what happens in a pump, right? So you might say, well, I would have caught that for sure, right? That, no one student's going to say that. But the thing is, you probably wouldn't have caught that first sentence. So if they had omitted that one, you might not have caught it. And it gets worse, right? If we go through this paper, we go to the next page. Here's more. It keeps going. And you know what else? I can click on any of these things, and it shows me the original source it came from. So then I can say, so it looks like you went to plantmaintenance.com. Can you explain to me why these two passages are so similar, right? And you know what bothers me? It's not like bad students do this. It's typically the good ones. It's the good ones that just get overwhelmed with all the work that they have to do, and they can't handle getting a bad grade. And so they try to cut corners. And you've got to make it clear, even to the good students, you can't cut corners, right? So I show, I literally go through these two papers for my students, too. I want them to know that I'm not going to be a jerk about it, right? I'm going to actually look. OK, let's get back to the presentation here. Of course. Because again, at the end, all the process output, and I didn't show you all of it, it all comes up as match percentage. Okay, again, even though it's completely irrelevant, it all comes up as match percentage. Okay, but what's the downside of using this? It works like a charm. What's the downside of using plagiarism screening software here? In fact, humor me, let's use this for some active learning, right? Come up with as many reasons as you can think of why this might be a bad idea to screen student documents for plagiarism. Please, turn to your neighbor and talk about it. I'll ask for some responses here in a minute. All right, all right, all right. So I think you guys have probably had enough time here. So uh, here, let's go with you. What do you think? Well, my, my first reaction was you're telling your students you don't trust them. OK. So the answer I got here was that I'm telling my students I don't trust them, right? Did anybody else say something similar? I bet a lot of you did, right? So this was something I was really worried about. I talked about the student-teacher relationship earlier. I don't want my students to think that I'm after them, right? I really don't. So this was one of the things I wanted to study whenever I started using this, because I'll be frank with you. If using this software destroys the relationship I have with my students, I'm not going to use it, period, right? I need them to trust me. So I wanted to look into this. So again, students might feel that the instructors don't trust them, so let's investigate that. Okay? It's not just a question, let's investigate it. You dig into the humanities literature, that whenever you use plagiarism screening software in a humanities class, poetry, history, something like that, students hate it. They will come back and they will fight you tooth and nail about it, they'll complain to the dean, it's going to be a big problem. But I was wondering, you know, 
The writing that humanities students do is different from what we do as engineers, right? With a humanities student, they write poetry. That's their work. They came up with that themselves. It's, it's poetry, right? It's, they own that. How dare you question that I wrote that? As engineers, we don't really do that. Mother Nature gives us everything we need. We just talk about it, right? Mother Nature gives us data. We analyze it and we discuss it. We communicate technical information. There's much less ownership, right? We're really just talking about what we see. That's it. So maybe students feel a little differently about it. So what we did is we used Turnitin in four of our classes over four semesters, so 16 total classes. We had 608 students total in those classes. And we asked them, we looked at how much plagiarism we found, and we investigated student views with a Likert-style questionnaire at the end of the semester, and we asked for student comments as well. So one of the things that we found was that we looked at two different kinds of plagiarism. There's malicious plagiarism, which is what we saw in that previous one, passing off somebody else's work as your own, no citation, you're, you're cheating, right? But then there's also non-malicious plagiarism because, frankly, if someone doesn't paraphrase very well, right, some people might say, oh, that's plagiarism, they should go to Office of Student Conduct. Maybe I just didn't do a very good job teaching them how to, you know, paraphrase. Or maybe they just need a little bit more instruction. You know, that's a good learning opportunity for me, and it helps identify those students who need more instruction. So we looked, and malicious instances of plagiarism were essentially the same between the four semesters before we use the software and the four semesters after. And this is complicated just a little bit because, you know, I'm very transparent with my students, and I let them know I'm using Turnitin to screen all of your documents before you turn them in, right, or when you turn them in. So I'm going to find if you plagiarize anything. So that in itself is a pretty big deterrent, right? If you know someone's screening all your documents for plagiarism, you're probably not going to plagiarize, though some people still did, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's important to tell them. You know, I think that if you just used it and then they find out that you're using it later, again, that student-teacher relationship is really harmed, I think. I think it's a bad thing. And, you know, I'm not trying to be tricky with my students. I'm not trying to cheat them. I'm just telling them, you know, it's not even that I don't trust you. It's that I don't want someone who doesn't do the work to get a great grade. Because again, you gotta remember, as engineers, we have a higher ethical standard than a lot of other fields. If we cheat and we don't know what we're doing, people get hurt, right? I mean, we have to know what we're doing. You wouldn't want to drive your car over a bridge with your family that was built by a civil engineer who cheated their way through school. You don't want that to happen. It's important that they understand that ethics are super important for them. So the non-malicious instances of plagiarism we're able to quickly identify who needed more instruction, right? But what do the students think? So I was kind of surprised by this. The students overwhelmingly loved that I was using this software, right? I gave them a, I asked them the question, how comfortable are you with me using this software to screen your assignments? One being basically you hate it, and five being that you love it, and the scores were 4.2 in that range. So what's going on here? And there's only 10% negative responses from students. You know, what is exactly going on? And to tease this out, I wanted to look at some of the student comments. And look at this first one. Please use this software to rid the program of those who don't deserve the degree, the degree that so many work so hard for. Basically, the good students wanted the cheaters to get caught, right? Because they're doing the work. And if anybody's cheating, get them out of here. Right? I don't want to be compared against people who are cheating because that's just going to make me look worse in comparison. People had lots of things to say, and it's all about being fair. It's all about being ethical, right? And good engineers should want to be ethical, and that's basically what we found. Now, that said, there were also concerns. These are very similar to what you hear about in the humanities literature on this same topic. So they worry that they're going to get in trouble for no reason, they think that it's just another bit of distrust that we don't think that they have any integrity. It's a witch hunt to try to find people, and that's not the case. And again, this was less than 10% of the people in the class who gave negative responses, right? These people are in the vast minority. So most people, most students, again, are in favor of using this type of software to screen documents for plagiarism. 
So if you're going to use software like this, be transparent. I don't think it's fair to not tell them that you're I think that that's going to engender, again, damage to the student-teacher relationship. Tell them why you're doing it, right? Say that it's important. You know, I mean, again, engineers cheat. People get hurt. You want to be an ethical person. That's just the way that it is. Don't use the match percent alone either. You know, if you're going to use this, you need to make sure that students know that you're going to give them a fair shake. You're not just going to go off of some number, right? And demonstrate how it's used. Again, just what I showed you, I show my students that too. I want them to know that I can find it out. And I want them to see exactly how it works. And I want to show them that paper that has a higher match percentage score and show them that that's not plagiarism, and I know that. The fact that they're single pass, double pipe, heat exchanger. I'm not going to take them to Office of Student Conduct over that, right? I want them to see me say that. OK, so we've come full circle here, back to teamwork. So this is probably the most relevant soft skill for engineers. Because again, once they get out into industry, they're going to be dealing with problems that are so complicated, one person can't solve it. It's not like a homework problem. Now you're talking about an engineering team. This is the norm in industry. Everybody works as part of a team. And working as part of a group is probably the toughest part of the job, right? I mean, engineering's tough enough, and now you've got people to deal with, some of whom you don't like, right? But the thing is, you have to learn to work with them, and you're going to be placed at random into groups with them. And I tell my students, you don't have to want to go out for drinks with them on the weekend, but you have to be able to work together towards a common goal, period. That's the way it works. So it's important that they get opportunities to work in teams while they're in a controlled environment in university. And the worst thing that happens is a few points off on a lab assignment or something instead of, oh, I didn't get a raise this year because my colleagues hate me, right? I want them to have to deal with that. I want them to try strategies to work with other people, find out what works, what doesn't, reassess and reevaluate their strategies, come up with new ones, and then try those out, see what works, what doesn't, and keep that cycle going so that once they actually get out into industry, they've already gone through this process. They know how to give criticism to colleagues in a professional way and not be jerks about it, right? I want them to have to go through all of this. So it's great to have teamwork in teams, but you gotta have, you gotta sign the teams, peer evaluation, you gotta collect all their peer evaluation scores, who on earth has the time to deal with all that, right? It takes forever to deal with all that. I was talking with um, someone earlier today, and she was saying that whenever it's time for her to distribute her teams, she puts out all of the information students have given her on scheduling and GPA all over her dining room table, right? And it takes her a whole evening to put everything together for what teams are going to be ideal. So there's an alternative. There's this... Uh, there's this program called CatMe that's available. And if any of you do engineering teamwork in your classes, I think that you should look into CatMe. It really makes things so easy, and I'm going to talk about why. If you, go, if you dig into the literature, they say that there are really a few things that you need to do whenever you're distributing a good student team. The students have to have similar schedules. Because if they don't have similar schedules, they're not going to have time to work together they're going to fail. It's not going to be able to work out for them. And if there's one poor person who has a job every evening, and because a lot of our students work in the evenings, they have a second job. So if that poor person can't attend any of the meetings because their schedule doesn't match up, they're going to get bad peer evaluation scores, almost through no fault of their own, right? So students have to be able to have similar schedules. But ideally, you want them to have dissimilar GPAs so that you don't get a whole bunch of great students and a whole bunch of poor students. You get a wide swath. Because again, that's what they're going to have to work with whenever they're in industry too, right? You're going to get a big cross-section of the whole engineering spectrum. But how on earth do you do that? I mean, you're either looking at, again, an avalanche of paper all over your dining room table, or you're looking at 800 emails to go with the other 800 that you got that day from other colleagues, right? And distributing teams by that criteria how on earth do you separate teams by similar schedules and then dissimilar GPAs? That's very difficult. So CatMe automates that process. Basically, you ask the students to upload their own scheduling information and their own GPAs into this web portal. You press a button. There's an optimization routine that optimizes all the teams based on whatever criteria you want. I group them by similar schedules and dissimilar GPAs. Some literature says that you shouldn't have, for instance, one woman in a group with four other men because they might be overwhelmed. Same thing with minorities as well. If you feel that that's something you want to do, you can do that as well. But again, 
click of a button. That's all you have to do. If you don't like the teams that come up, you press the button again, and you get all new teams, right? So then, once you're done distributing teams, you can set up the dates that you want peer evaluations to start coming in. So on you know, January 30th, send out an email to all the teams saying to collect peer evaluation data, and it'll be open for three or four days, right? Well, what's nice is that sometimes, I mean, I'm a busy guy. Sometimes whenever I, before I use this program, I would forget to send out peer evaluations, and then I'm in trouble because now I don't have the data I need to assign grades properly. So what I do now is at the very beginning of the semester, I immediately set it up, cap me, so that it distributes, it will distribute all of my emails to everyone. In fact, right now, today, while I was here, Catme was sending emails to my student teams. They have an assignment due today while I'm out here. And Catme was sending out emails to everybody to collect their peer evaluation data. And it's not just in one category. It's not like they give them a number like, oh, Jonathan did a four out of five on this experiment. It's not quite like that. This is what CatMe looks like to the students, and this is just one category. So there's going to be five categories that they look at, and they're going to score each other on. One of them is contributing to the team's work. How big was your contribution, or how, what do your peers think of your contribution to the team's work? Another one is interacting with the team. And you know, this is a key thing. Some engineers are really, really technically gifted and will contribute a lot to their team's work, but they're total jerks, right? And the thing is, is that if you just gave them a number that says your teammate scored you 3.8 out of 5, but really what it was is they got like four fives in all the categories and then a one in the interacting with teammates category because everybody thought they were a jerk, they're not going to have any idea what they need to fix, right? So this feedback goes back to the individual student in aggregate so that they can see what their teammates gave them on average. And then CatMe is a behavioral model. So it actually gives tips for things that you can do. If you get really bad scores on interacting with teammates, it'll give you ideas on how to accept criticism and how to give criticism, ways to interact with other people. If it's contributing to team's work, it'll say, did you miss any deadlines? Did you attend all the group's meetings? The, this kind of feedback that students really need to know in order to improve their contribution to the team. And I really like using this because then if students say, I'm really unhappy with the score I got on this report. Why did I get such bad peer evaluation scores, Dr. Cooper? I say, why are you asking me? Go ask your team, right? And so many engineers are very passive aggressive about giving feedback to each other. I want them to have to talk about that. If someone got a bad score because they showed up late to every single meeting and people are just afraid to tell them, those students shouldn't be afraid to tell that person. They should be able to come out and say, Yes, you got a bad peer evaluation score because you were always late. Like, we were ready to work. We set up this time in advance, and you were always late. It's really unprofessional. If you start showing up on time, we won't give you that bad score. That's really good feedback. That's professional feedback, the kind of thing you would say to a colleague who was working with you on a project professionally, right? Students need to learn that kind of interaction and that ability. So the nice thing, too, it's confidential. All of this is online. Students do it on their own time. They're not in the same room with their colleagues who they're giving bad scores to or anything like that. And 93% of students will submit these online peer evaluation results, right? So if they don't, it's not like they lose points. It's just that they don't get any input into how scores are distributed amongst their team. There's no paper forms. There's no emails. You can take all the data that they give you. It's easy to cut and paste into Excel, and it's already split up into all the student teams. So little, you know, control C, control V, you've got all of your scores that you need. It takes no time at all. This saves me eight to ten hours a semester, I'm not even joking with you, using this to distribute teams and collect peer evaluation feedback. And it's totally free. Again, it's just cat me. I have no association with the people who run this either. I'm just telling you because, again, it's one of the things that, honestly, at NC State in our department, we use this in every single class where we do teamwork. It's just very, very helpful, and if you have a class where you use teaming, I think it'll really help you out and save you a lot of time. So what do the students think of this? I always like to ask the student comments, right? So they like that it's confidential. It gives them a little time to reflect, and that reflection is important. You know, maybe in the heat of the moment, after they turn in a report, they're really upset about how it went, but then they take a minute to think about it, and they say, you know what? Maybe that was just a really tough assignment. 
Maybe I shouldn't give all my teammates terrible scores. They actually did a pretty good job, right? Gives them a little bit of time to reflect. And then this last person, I forgot the paper evaluations, or I forgot to fill out the online evaluations, so I prefer to do them in class. You can't win them all, right? So for in conclusion here, in my opinions and recommendations, active learning, I think, is a really good thing. I think that it makes lectures Right? Because you actually get to take a little break every now and again, turn to your neighbor, talk about something, and then you're ready to talk again. I know for me, listening to a professor prattle on for like 60 minutes is just excruciating sometimes, right? Also, with conceptual testing, I think it's key that engineers understand why they're doing things and why phenomenon occurs, not just how to work out all those equations, right? Because once they get into industry, that conceptual knowledge, that's why they get paid. Right? It's not because they can work out calculations. A computer can do that. With plagiarism screening software, the big thing here is I think it's important, but you have to use it correctly. And keep in mind that engineering students, not necessarily humanities students, but engineering students favor its use. Right? Also, CatMe's free. It helps you save time. It's good for teaming. Gives students good feedback on how they performed as part of a team. I think it's a really critical thing for you to be able to give students that kind of feedback. So that's everything I have to talk with you about today, guys. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, whenever you say how you want to release the data, so some people don't want the students to know what other students said about them, not uh, with the comments, but they don't want even students to know what their scores are. You can choose to release the data to only you as an instructor, to only the instructor and the researchers, to the students, the instructor and the researchers, or just the student and the instructor. So you get to choose whether they get the data or not. Yeah. How realistic is it to uh, uh, parallel the making of teams in a school environment and that in a small to mid-sized enterprise where there are a certain number of engineers and they're the ones who are going to be in the team. Nobody cares if they like each other or if they're compatible in any way. They'll have to do the job. Yeah. So um, the big thing is, is I think they need those. I think they need those skills, right? They need to be put in those situations while we have this controlled environment. Because again, sometimes students will come to me and they'll say, "Dr. Cooper, I don't know how to deal with this person. They're a real jerk, and they won't work, and everything." And then sometimes we have to say, like, "Well, maybe you should put everything in writing." If they say that, "Oh, I didn't get that email that we had this appointment for a meeting," well, then I can give them that kind of feedback, right? But again, these are things that they would have to figure out on their own otherwise. And I want to be able to give them that kind of feedback as they go through. Yeah, I've got one question actually. Yeah. Plagiarism software. Uh, when you pitched the idea, you said that uh, Playhouses might have like archives and stuff, right? But it looked like the plagiarism software looked at archives online. So how do you, how do you deal with inter-institutional or legacy type of uh, so every uh, document that I upload or most students upload, they upload all their own documents, right? I don't upload anything. Every document that they upload goes into the server. Right. So now I can look back at all of the previous, it gets compared against all of the previous articles that have been posted by my students. So yeah, if somebody, again, the brother from a few years ago, or even, let's say, a cousin at the University of Wisconsin who's doing a similar experiment, if they use Turnitin, it's there too. Yeah. How do you determine if it's malicious or That's a really good question. And you know, those are my definitions, right? So another faculty member might say, even the things that I consider to be non-malicious plagiarism, those are things that should be sent to student conduct, right? So the way that I look at it is it's a little fuzzy. I mean, do I think the person was trying to put something past me? If so, then, and it always starts with me talking with them, right? I literally say, you know, look at these two documents. Here's yours. Here's this other document. 
explain to me how this happened. And sometimes there's a really good explanation, right? But if they don't have an explanation and it looks like it's cheating and I think they're cheating, that's how it goes. And if I think that maybe they just made a mistake or they have a good explanation or, no, I got it from this source and I thought it was okay just to change these words around. I mean, I'll work with them. You know, I don't want to be somebody wielding a hammer, sending everyone to Office of Student Conduct. It ruins my day every time I have to do that, right? But, you know, it's part of the job, too. And if I think somebody's trying to cheat, it's my job to take them to student conduct. Yeah. Do the students have access to turnin.com, and do they try to gain the system? Do they check their own? That's a really good question, too. So there are, you can give students the option to look at their own originality reports on turnitin.com. I don't do that because, like you said, students could gain the system. They could upload a document, see what comes up as a match, change just enough to make it pass through the filters. So I don't do that. Other professors do. So again, it's a personal choice. You know? And so I don't because, again, I don't want students to think they can. But other people say, no, that helps them learn good skills on what is and what isn't plagiarism. So, you know, I mean, I can see both sides of the coin. No, no particular answer is absolutely correct. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Um, so you said for the uh, active learning, we'll just do all the sections. Uh-huh. So go back all the way back to active learning. Uh, you said these questions which you were you made people discuss, not just like, oh, yes, increases or decreases. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was an example of a quicker question. So it's mm-hmm. not exactly the same thing. So could you elaborate, like, why did you choose that example with a syringe? Kind of sure. What you told us sure. So keep in mind that what I was showing... Um, and they were two slightly different sections. So the conceptual one, that isn't an active learning question, right? The one with the syringe or the one with the pump. Neither of those are active learning questions. Those are questions that I'll ask the students, say, on paper, right? So for instance, um, is it higher, lower, the same, and explain, right? So those are things that I'll put on paper for the students. But no, if it's going to be an active learning exercise, it's typically more open-ended, right? Where you can get a lot of responses. Or maybe it's more difficult, right? But no, I wouldn't ask a question like that for an active learning exercise. Any other questions? I have a question for Mark here. Do we have all this stuff? <laughs> we get it if you want. <laughs>